Bill's camera. Oh, oh Bill's, yeah. ca- Bill's camera is yeah, facing somebody yeah, else. Yeah, famous Larry yeah. Schultz. Yeah, it's it's yeah, the motion sensor camera. Yeah, <laughs> we actually did it. Two Larrys. We got two Larrys. <laughs> My two Larrys. All right, Mister Ferretti, you are leadoff hitter, and uh, that makes you number one. Well, Rob, you you recall that we, we sat around the studio Wednesday, Bill and I, and we we're talking about the difficulty coming up with subjects to discuss during the Friday show because we're we're look we're in the middle of summer here and and uh, everybody's vacationing and, and thinking of other things. But as we vacation this summer, uh, one issue I thought that might stir the pot a little bit are, are these facts. And these are facts, folks. We just went through, in June this year, the hottest month on record going back to 1850. And July 6th of this year was recorded as the hottest day ever globally. And in 2023, right now, we are on track for the hottest year ever, if trends continue. And by the way, the eight hottest years on record just happen to be the last eight years we've lived through. So all the hysteria about climate change, is it real? Is it uh, fabricated? Is it some plot to ruin business interest in this country and elsewhere, or is it a legitimate concern that we all must begin taking into account? We can debate that forever. But what I'm interested in is the impact that we might, it might have on our state, West Virginia, since we are one of the leading fossil fuel states in the country. And we just had a very important U.S. Supreme Court action to allow fossil fuels to be transported through and outside of West Virginia. We know that coal mining continues to be vital to the interest of the state. All you have to do is look at the tax collection numbers for severance taxes, which make up a healthy percentage of this uh, excess money that we continue to crow about in West Virginia. So I'm thinking as a fossil fuel state, in the face of these undeniable facts about climate change, do we have to start planning ahead here uh, for a day when we're not going to have coal mining, when we're not going to have severance taxes? Uh, do we? What, what is it in West Virginia that we have to do as a public policy matter? I think we need to start transitioning significantly towards other business. And away from mining, we have to plan for the day we don't have severance tax money. And we have to diversify this economy very quickly. And I am fearful that we're not doing that, despite all these announcements about new businesses coming to West Virginia. I'm fearful that we are not investing in our higher education to train people, to educate them for the jobs of tomorrow. So is it incumbent upon West Virginia to get moving on this? I think it is. I'm interested in what others have to say. All right, let's start with our resident geologist, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, Joe, you've raised a subject where you spend easily the next three weeks talking about, and it has so many dimensions, so many considerations. Uh, I'm sure Mike Carl is going to address the economic uh, aspect and and how we adjust that. Uh, there's another aspect to it, and that's the scientific aspect. Uh, I, as you know, I've been very nervous about the impacts of climate change or global warming for quite a while. Uh, we're seeing it now. We're seeing it real time. We think about what we're seeing in the, the heat dome over the southwest. It's moving now over hours. Uh, those are short short-term phenomena that we all can relate to. Same thing with more intense storms and the like, uh, which, I, which has been documented are all related to man-made climate change. Uh, but there's another aspect that I think is much more real and more disturbing, and that's what's happening in the Arctic. We hear a lot about the Antarctica. Antarctica is just going to raise uh, sea level, and that would affect the coastal areas, uh, the melting of Antarctica. But the Arctic is something much more severe. Uh, we have used the cold water from the Arctic that has driven what they call the Atlantic Meridian Overturn uh, Circulation that basically is the, the engine that drives this conveyor belt in the oceans. 
How does the conveyor belt uh, uh, seem uh, important to us? It provides the warmth from the equator being moved north that we, uh, we benefit from. If the conveyor belt is turned off, which there's a great chance it will be. It will be, but the time is how long. We're going to be entering into an ice age in the northern latitudes, ice age fairly intense because there's not going to be any warming coming from the equator. We're going to be uh, uh, severe droughts in the tropics, uh, much more uh, with intense storms. There's going to be a whole cascading effect. The question is, when is this going to happen? There's a study recently that said it could happen anywhere between 2025 and the end of the century. We're talking about the very near term. Other scientists have disputed this and saying that's an error. But my point is, yes, we got real problems. It's evading your question, Joe. That's an economic issue. But when we start this, we have another whole series of economic challenges. Mr. Carl. Well, uh, let me say that the, the, the trends that you've you know, raised or, you know, they are. It's just how it's how urgent uh, is the response. But let, let's keep in mind that uh, the eastern panhandle is the, you know, growing part of West Virginia, and it, it's not because of fossil fuels. Um, and I was involved in, when I was in, you know, far more active practice with uh, at least a half a dozen major industrial uh, developments uh, particularly involving the uh, 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 payment in lieu of tax and the you know the property tax problem that that uh, we established this mechanism and then defended in court, but none of them were fossil fuel endeavors. So they're they're you know we're we're moving in the direction that you called for, uh, you know, and it it won't hurt to step up the pace, but but there is progress being made to to. Uh, reduce our reliance on the revenues from fossil fuel, Mr. Carl. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Height. Well, first, I want to I want to thank um, the admiral for admitting that there is scientists that disagree on this issue. That there are scientists that 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 back what you're saying, and there are scientists that that disagree with a, a lot of what's being said. Um, when it comes to the economy of West Virginia, I think that has happened. That diversification has happened over the past 10 to 12 years where a Republican-led legislature has tried to make things easier for business to come to West Virginia. And you see that happening all the time now. Um, we are less reliant um, on, on coal and severance taxes than we were in the past. And we are getting more and more diversified with our economy so i see those things happen and that that trend just needs to continue um when it comes to climate i i think most people recognize that there's climate change it, it comes down to a question of how much of this is man-made what percentage is man-made you can look back in in history and over new york city there was two miles of of ice above New York City. Well, if we had had the same thought process back then, we would have been freaking out when it started to, to melt. Well, it's been melting for millions and millions of years. And I, I think the argument now is that humans have accelerated that, that movement. Well, maybe, maybe not. I think that's the, the big debate. How much have humans um, contributed to climate change in the past 100 to 150 years? I, I personally don't see anything wrong with it. I don't see where humans are making that big of an impact. This melting trend has been going on for millions of years. It will continue un until there is a change. Like, Bill, you say, you know, the changes may create an, a new ice age. Well, I think the Earth's been going through those changes for millions and millions of years. So I don't see the big deal myself. Mr. Schultz. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that the the overwhelming science uh, is now being proved uh, right by the statistics that show that the hottest years on record are the last eight, um, going back to 1850. And yeah, we've had glacial uh, ice ages, and I grew up in a county in northern Pennsylvania that had a, a little recreation area called Pikes Rocks where there were boulders as big as this building 
that you could climb all over. And what that represented was where the ice age that created the Great Lakes stopped. <laughs> and when it stopped, it had been pushing these boulders ahead of it down through Canada all these years. And then they were left there. And that was a, a time when I was, you know, f uh, 50 years ago or more, when I was first learning about this stuff in school. And it was a pretty cool thing to think about. I believe that, at least for me, and I'm no, I'm not a scientist, but I believe that the scientific evidence of our acceleration of this problem is clear. And even if it's not, coal is on the way out anyhow. It's going elsewhere. And we're going elsewhere in our fuel choices, even if there is no global warming. And so this issue that Joe talks about of diversifying our economy is going to be true whether the climate scientists uh, who say we're entering a warming age um, caused by man, whether they're right or not, uh, coal's going away. It's well, just I, too dirty. But I, I, you say coal's going away, but it's not going away. You can see where there are European countries that are putting coal plants back online. China's building many, many coal plants right mm -hmm. now. It's only going away in the United States. It's not going away worldwide. So it, it's still being used, and and it's it's growing in certain areas. It is, but the net, I believe, is a decrease. And over time, uh, coal is going to, you know, it'll still be used, but it is going to become less and less and less. The other states that produce a lot of coal in the United States have worked pretty hard over the years, while West Virginia not quite so hard, to diversify to other fuels, to other means of making a living. I mean, aside from climate change, it never made any sense for the state of West Virginia to sell its natural resources and allow these companies to poison our rivers, to poison our streams, to tear down our mountains. We've largely changed ourselves. There's not that many states that undergo the kind of crushing change West Virginia has geographically and in our land uh, just to make uh, money from coal. There are some. I think Wyoming probably is tearing down quite a few quite a few high hills and mountains these days. But it's not nearly as prevalent as it was 100 years ago, and I think it's on the way out. I, I, I honestly do. Joe, circles back to you. Well, uh, just to address the, the argument about the long-term trends, uh, ice ages and all that, uh, there's a, a segment of scientists, uh, paleoclimatologists, who study things like, like the, the rings on trees and, and then geology to, to look at the very long-term trends. And we're talking about thousands and thousands of years. And there are papers published in, there, in that area that indicate that this globe is heating at a rate 10 times faster than it did when we initially came out of the Ice Age. And so the trends are alarming. And that is what we're focusing on today with, with as Larry said, the greater weight of evidence from these scientists, which are that the trends are very troublesome. And what I hope to see in the state of West Virginia is the trend towards diversifying the economy even more than we're doing now. I agree with Mike. Businesses are coming in that are not related to fossil fuels. That's a great thing. But it's going to take a, a, a bigger picture approach to this including how we're educating West Virginians for future jobs and how the legislature should not be resistant to funding higher education and, and, and actually working in hand in hand with these colleges to make sure that they have the curriculum necessary for future jobs and to support that with our tax dollars. Uh, I think that's the approach we should be taking because it won't be long in the state of West Virginia where coal mining is not being done even on the scales being done today, which, by the way, uh, just in 10 years, coal mine employment has dropped over 50 percent. So that trend is, is evident, too. And I think we just have to plan for that in the future. Let me ask a question in regards to uh, the climate and fossil fuels, Joe, and diversification of an economy. Uh, let's take the jobs of actually mining coal or producing natural gas out of the equation 
and move a bunch of companies into West Virginia that require, for their heating and cooling, the production of power that allows you to air condition your building or heat it in the winter. Let's say that West Virginia gets a Tesla factory and everybody in West Virginia gets a discount on a Tesla and goes out and buys one and at the end of the day they got to plug it back into the grid and they've got to charge that Tesla and that electricity has got to come from something and somewhere. So can you really diversify an economy that right now still overwhelmingly relies on fossil fuels to run it? Well, you know, a couple of years ago, um, I took my hammered old boat out for a ride on Mount Storm Lake. And there's a certain point at the lake, uh, Mount Storm, where you look to your left and it's Norway. There's a whole row of uh, windmills. And then you turn around and look back to your right and there's a coal-powered electric plant surging black smoke into the sky and I, I, I it, it's just an amazing thing to see it's like I'm stuck between Norway and West Virginia <laughs> and uh, you know but both of these things are in West Virginia and we can do this mm -hmm. we can you know we can find other sources that aren't as polluting and aren't as warming uh, to do the work I do believe Joe yeah, and I think we're going to have to, uh, look, Three Mile Island was 50 years ago. And I think as a nation, we're going to have to revisit nuclear power and, and what we're capable of doing safely in that realm. Uh, th that is something that, that the policymakers are going to have to study, and we're going to have to be prepared to perhaps go that route. Because, uh, you know, coal reserves in this country, uh, again, the data shows that the coal reserves are being depleted. I'm not saying we're going to run out of coal in the next 10 years. That's not happening. But there will be a day we do. And uh, the same is going to be true with natural gas and, and other fossil fuels. So I, I think part of the answer, sure, are those windmills Larry's talking about. But also part of it is uh, looking at nuclear. And the other part, Joe, is batteries. We've made phenomenal improvement in batteries technology. We will continue to do that. Uh, we have energy sources uh, available to us. The problem is storage of this energy until we actually need it, and batteries will be the solution. Imagine that. We just voted to have a, a battery uh, plant in West Virginia. Warm I, energy. Yeah, I thought it was great. I yeah, that's what we need to. Wait a second. Now, yeah. Weren't you endorsing uh, Bill Gates as a child molester with that vote? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I was en endorsing um, the the uh, purchase of land and development of that land yeah. for a business to come here to West Virginia, and it could be Form Energy, and yeah. they produce large capacity storage batteries for power plants. Those batteries would sit right beside a coal-producing power plant, and they would store energy for peak hours and allow yeah. um, or prevent brownouts or blackouts. And, uh, Mike, that is a move in the right direction, something that I, I know there's a plug you for doing. Uh, that battery capability is about 100 hours. Uh, but that's a major step forward. What we need are batteries, and they're working on it, to be 1,000 hours. And that's what we'll need to move toward by the way while i have legal counsel in the room i want to make sure everybody understands i was not accusing mr gates of any nefarious <laughs> crimes uh, neither implied nor implicit in that joke there. that's a good move I right there i think that's going to be left up to others to decide what you actually meant just uh, simply referring to some of the comments on the house of delegates members facebook pages who voted for that legislation uh, Mr. Stubblefield, you are on the clock at uh, 9 o'clock. This is Talk Radio, WNR Martinsburg and TV 10, a segment brought to you in part by elder care attorney Danny Staggers. If you or a loved one are concerned about going into a nursing home and losing assets, contact elder care attorney Danny Staggers today in Martinsburg at 304-267-3915. Also by Orsini's Home Store. Just does an appliance store any longer. Visit them at 360 Hack Wilson Way, Martinsburg, or online at orsinis.com. Do 
Do you have someone in a nursing home or are you worried about somebody you love going into a nursing home? The law firm of Daniel Staggers can protect your assets. Call the law firm of Daniel Staggers today at 304-267-3915. The Daniel Staggers law firm does elder care law, estate planning, and special needs trusts for disabled children and family members. Visit the Daniel Staggers law firm for your initial free consultation at 133 East John Street in Martinsburg. The Daniel Staggers law firm, when you need asset protection for you or for a family member. Have you been smoking? Uh, I can smell it. Hickory. I'm going to watch you smoke the whole pack. Shut now and save at Orsini's today. Have you been smoking? Uh, I can smell it. Hickory. I'm going to watch you smoke the whole pack. Shut now and save at Orsini's today. Is your business or organization looking to make a difference in the lives of women and families? Partner with Abacare Pregnancy Resource Center as a corporate sponsor and make an impact in your community today. Located at 319 South Raleigh Street in Martinsburg, Abacare provides free and confidential medical services, including pregnancy testing, ultrasounds, and options education, as well as resources and referrals to women and families facing unplanned pregnancies. Call 540-665-9660 or contact info at abacare.org to learn more about Abacare's corporate sponsorship opportunities. My kids, you know I want the best for you, don't you? We need to have a conversation. End-of-life planning is no one's favorite discussion, but the relief of having everything in place when the hour of need arrives is a gift. Give it to your family. Plan ahead with us. Brown Funeral Homes, a leading provider of cremations, invites you to explore the many flexible options of cremation. From environmental considerations to the benefit of greatly reduced cost, it may be the perfect answer for your family. Online at brownfuneralhomeswv.com. Brown Funeral Homes, here for you. The future doesn't wait. Why should you? Blue Ridge Community and Technical College offers over 60 degree and certificate programs in education, IT, culinary arts, engineering, and so much more. Small class sizes, flexible schedules with evening and online classes, affordable tuition, plus financial aid is available to those who qualify. Now you can go to college. Visit us online at blueridgectc.edu. That's blueridgectc.edu. Stop waiting and enroll today. Do you need a place to go for a quick tobacco, soda, snacks, cigarettes, or beer run? Well, then you're in luck, because Enter and Exit has convenience without the cost. Enter and Exit, right off Route 11, is located at 31 Meadow Lane in Martinsburg and soon to be opening in Chambersburg, PA. Enter and Exit is open Monday through Saturday from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. and Sundays from 9.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. For great convenience without the cost, stop on into Enter and Exit today. With four new car dealerships and four used car dealerships in three states, Parsons is the largest used car and fastest growing new car dealer in the tri-state area. Take Parsons Ford with huge savings on hundreds of new Fords, financing from 0%, Parsons' goal of financing for all, and Parsons' famous above-market trade-in allowances that help make Parsons number one for used cars, too. See why so many won't buy anywhere but Parsons Ford in Martinsburg. We became number one by making you number one first. Parsons. If you or someone you know suffers from the disease of addiction, help is available from the Berkeley County Quick Response Team with peer recovery coaches and support promptly to the homes of those who've recently experienced an overdose. This collective effort towards recovery brings resources and services to the community, including naloxone and treatment options. Call 304-267-1313 or visit the Berkeley County Recovery Resource Center at 800 Emmett Rouse Drive, Martinsburg. The Berkeley County Quick Response Team is funded through a DHHR grant with the Berkeley Morgan County Health Department. Your decision to give up the dream of being governor and now pursuing the office of attorney general. I found myself surrounded by some folks. One of them is the popular delegate and the son of a, one of West Virginia's more formidable families. The other one is a very successful businessman who also comes from the same kind of family. you got Mac Warner, a decorated military family and, and one of our, our most famous military families in the state. And then Patrick Morrissey, a wildly successful attorney general and is a fundraising juggernaut. When you look at the idea of service, you have to sort of match your skills with your timing. The accomplishments that I've made 
made in the auditor's office, the experience that I've gotten in the auditor's office, and the ability that I have to transform government to make West Virginians' lives better matches up with the Attorney General's office. And so when you match timing with service, that is the decision that we came to. Your opponents um, in the AG race have already been critical of you in their press releases about this decision. I am focused on myself, and I'm focused on our campaign and our ability to serve and, and the great many supporters that I have that are very excited. Live from the Talk Radio WRNR studios, it's time for Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob Mario. Thank you, Cliff Maxwell. Welcome back to the show. Produced by Nick the Knife Vezzolini and brought to you in part by the Berkeley County Health Department's Quick Response Team. Our Friday Five in studio, Delegate Michael Height. Good morning, Robert. Tax Commissioner Michael Carl. Good morning. The Admiral Bill Stumblefield. Good morning, Rob. Attorney at Law Larry Schultz. Good morning, Rob. And via telephone, Attorney at Law Joseph Joey Torts Ferretti. And is uh, Joe you still with us? Present. All right. Good. <laughs> I thought you were going to be that wiseacre fifth grader who always said president whenever they would take attendance. Just say I. Yeah. Feinstein. I noticed many of you conducting your own shows in our comment section during the course of this discussion. <laughs> we, lose our, we lose our audience fairly quick. They have their own no, no, no. agenda. No, no, no. I'm talking about it. our members of the Friday Five are conducting their shows oh. with the audience members on Facebook. I see. Okay. Sharing. Defend, defending my position. Sharing. And, and, uh, and Height said we've got plenty of time in his comment section to answer anybody during Bill's questions. So the <laughs> issue there appears to be one of timing, uh, apparently. Yeah, just imagine, Mike, if you had um, uh, Mitch McConnell asking the questions. You'd have all kinds of time. Well, I tell you, we were discussing that earlier. That's, Feinstein that's and scary. McConnell yeah. both, it's time for him to go, and, and Biden as well. Yeah, there's a difference between the Mr. Stubblefield, you're on deck. Yeah, I think this may come back up again. <laughs> yeah. This may come back again later, I'm thinking. Mr. Stubblefield, yeah. you're on. Yeah, well, let's go from climate change to politics. Uh, this is the part of the year that there are a lot of polls, certain persons in lead and the like, and there's a lot of money being spent by the candidates. Uh, how much of a voice do we as citizens uh, actually have? In Michigan, for example, on the Republican side, there are 55 delegates. 16 are uh, selected by voters. The remainders are in a closed-door caucus. There are several, so there's one state that's having the uh, delegates who will select the, uh, the candidate uh, to meet and make their decision uh, two months before the election. Uh, there's other states that have one or takes all. So that means that uh, if you're a strong second-place center uh, candidate, such as maybe Ron DeSantis, uh, he's going to be shut out in all of these states. Uh, that want to take all. So my question is, are we drifting in the direction that we as a voter have, have very little say-so on who the candidates will be or limited say-so on who the candidates will be? That's a good question. Larry Schultz, you go first. Yes, um, I think there's a chance at least that the Republican side of this uh, um, setup that we have is drifting that way. Um, I'm not hearing that the Democratic Party is going to take anything away from its voters. Um, it's going to let the voters decide. And now we don't, particularly in the presidential race this time, have much of a um, of a competition going on because a lot of people know that Joe Biden uh, is going to be the nominee and they're not interested in challenging him. But yeah, some of the some of the Republican uh, states are starting to take it away from the voters or sort of uh, limit their choices. And I think that's terrible. Mr. Carl? Well, I think that, you know, there's a, 50 states and they're all, you know, they all have their independent process. of. Uh, it's not a problem in West Virginia, but West Virginia only has uh, uh, what, five electoral votes. So it, it, it's, it's really... Uh, I know four. That's right. We lost. Yeah, yeah. I go back to when we had six, but uh, that's a long time ago. But but uh, you know, I, I, I'm not. I don't think this is a great you know, broad-based movement to take away individual voters' input. Or, you know, right for input. But let's remember the limitations of it, no matter what because of the size of the country and the diversity of the of the structures in the in the different states. Mr. Ferretti. 
Well, I, I, I think there's a, a, a troublesome trend towards uh, limiting the, the, the impact of the vote uh, in, in certain states. Uh, I'm heartened by the fact that uh, two guys could get drummed out of the Tennessee legislature and, and a special election uh, ensues after that, and, and those two fellows are voted right back in. So in that sense, the, the voter had a, a, had a direct say on who the representative should be. Uh, but I can tell you in the state of Georgia, there's been some troublesome trends about um, uh, how the secretary of state – in, in, in the state of Georgia, the powers that that office had have been greatly diminished by legislative action to the point now where the legislature, the state legislature, really has oversight over uh, elections that we typically, uh, powers that we vested in the county election officials, then going up to the secretary of state, the state legislature now can step in and invalidate votes in certain districts or certain precincts if the legislature feels that there has been some questions raised about the validity of the vote. And, and that is a trend that I, I think and I fear you might see in other states too because uh, recall that it was the Secretary of State in Georgia who stood up to the pressure from the Trump administration to overturn the results in the Georgia election in 2020. And it was that Secretary of State who has been interviewed by Jack Smith and the Department of Justice regarding that influence from the Trump administration. And it is that situation that may result any day now in charges regarding efforts to overturn the 2020 election. So uh, I, I see a, a, a real concern in some states about efforts to, to uh, I guess, react to what happened at least in the state of Georgia, and I think also in the state of Arizona uh, and Nevada, about uh, how questions were raised, how, how you know, weak and, and, and spurious those questions were. Uh, questions were raised about the validity of the election, and now power is being consolidated in state legislatures to oversee these elections. That in and of itself will strip the power of the electorate to determine who their representatives are. Mr. Height. So I'm, I'm going to disagree some with what Larry said, that this is a Democrat-Republican thing. I don't think it is. This is a state-by-state -state thing. Different states have their elections and, and you know, choose who their representatives are um, in different ways. Uh, and that's been going on for a long time. There haven't been a whole lot of changes in the way each individual state does it. Um, but to that effect, a lot of this, I, I think, a lot of these states and the way they do things is an, a system that's antiquated, that they did it that way because, you know, back in the day, you had to elect delegates to go to Charleston and, and then vote as a body. And so that's not needed today with today's technology. So should some of these states, you know, reform how they do elections? Absolutely. Um but I also think that there are states like West Virginia that don't have a whole lot of say. If you look at a presidential election, when's the last time West Virginia decided on who the presidential nominee was going to be, whether it's Democrat or Republican? We haven't. Probably uh, JFK. We're, yeah. Right. We're, we're talking <laughs> 1960. So it, it just doesn't matter. Until we can have a system where um, the primary is held, all the states have their primary at a relatively the same time, then places like West Virginia just aren't going to matter a whole lot because by the time you get to West Virginia, the nominee for president, whether it's Democrat or Republican, has already been decided that, that your guy is probably already dropped out. Um, so, you know, I think we need to probably look at a, a nationwide, the state's nationwide need to look at their systems and probably have some reforms to make sure that these types of things these backroom deals where where 20 30 people get in and decide who the nominee is going to be that kind of stuff has to ha has to stop and and it's up to the states to make that happen yeah, a couple of things on that, uh, and, uh, and I agree with Mike that this is not a uh, partisan issue. If you remember in 2020, the supermajority issue became up on the Democratic side. Uh, their supermajority uh, uh, had something like uh, 
15 to 20% of all the de uh, control of the delegates. Uh, Democrats took action on that. The supermajority has been diminished quite a bit. But the point, Mike, that I, I think you're, you're making that, that bothers me, not your point, but the trend, is that uh, uh, Donald Trump is very active in working not the the voters as much as he's working the infrastructure, the, the power brokers. And he's made, supposedly, he's made deals with in several states of those individuals that will determine who the candidate will be. So he's kind of bypassing uh, the uh, the voters themselves and have gone to the back room movers and shakers. And in several states that can work, Nevada, for example, I think it can work, Arizona to some degree. Uh, it's just we we advertise ourselves or we think of ourselves as a democracy therefore that we vote for someone who's going to represent us if the trend is what i see that we're losing that ability if the if our candidate is selected by someone other than the ballot box that is disturbing it's not happening every place but there's it's happening in some places joe any final words there yeah, I, I can. I, I see Bill's point, and again, I'll, I'll refer to Georgia. Uh, not only uh, are there some backroom deals being made, but boy, there's just a lot of, of nefarious activity in terms of where where voting booths and voting precincts are set up. Uh, you know, what's happening in Georgia is you go out into these rural counties, and and they'll have an overabundance of polling booths and, and precincts to vote in, and then they'll greatly limit the voting that takes place in some of the urban areas where you have to stand in line for two to three hours just to cast a vote. Uh, you know, it, there's a lot of shenanigans going on, and, and I think it feeds into the fact that backroom deals are cut to make you know, voting impediments a reality. All right, let's move on to issue number three, and we go to Delegate Mike Height for that. Now, Mike, uh, we're fortunate that you have an issue because there was a power move made last <laughs> night to try to lock the issues up so that there were none out there to discuss other than those reserved by a couple of gentlemen on the five. They did. A couple of the gentlemen, they, they put in. We're supposed to have three different, and and I think there was like, eight or ten from Stubblefield, and then Carl came back with his six or seven. I mean, by the time it got to Larry and, and Joe and I, there weren't a whole lot of issues left. I only had two. Right. I see. <laughs> and let me point out, Stubblefield and Carl, along with their little power group there, on Thursday mornings get together yeah, and yeah. basically do a dress rehearsal for this show. So that's how they know what the issues are going to be, and they try to lock them down. If it resonates with our group, it's going to resonate with anybody. <laughs> Yeah, all right, Mr. Height, what do you got left? All right, so I got – I'm, I'm going to go back to the, the Hunter Biden deal. So when the judge didn't accept the Hunter Biden plea deal, did that benefit Hunter Biden in any way? Did, did the judge not accepting the plea deal benefit Hunter Biden in any way? All right, let me start first with one of Hunter's biggest supporters, Mike Carl. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> 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 well, <clears throat> I, I, I think I think it did. In a, in and Bill, a, you might want to put on that beehive hat because he's sitting next to you right now. I, I, I think it did in a, in a kind of a perverse way because I think there's so much evidence of further wrongdoing that will come out one you know, by one means or another, not not through that precise case that 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 would show the the the, the horrible error the judge made by accepting it. So I, I think it, I think it helped uh, Hunter in a you know, indirect way that that uh, he, he, you know this this won't be a they they said well he's a private citizen but he showed up in six federal uh, security uh, vehicles to, for for this plea bar mm -hmm. plea, plea deal yeah. so uh, he 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 will only be benefited if justice is performed and. The people believe that justice has been performed. All right, uh, Larry Schultz. Yes. Um, the first thing that occurs to me is um, we probably should set up a betting pool on who will lose their right to vote first, Hunter Biden or Donald Trump. How, how did um, you turn this into a Donald Trump <laughs> issue? <laughs> well, uh, that's an interesting question because. Uh, um, 
you know, we actually have witnesses in the Trump matter. Try, try to stay on are, the try, gonna, to, try to stay on the question well, at hand, Larry. Well, the question <laughs> at hand is whether this helps Hunter Biden. I don't see how it does. On the other hand, um, there was some question from the very beginning whether this was going to be it. In other words, when you set up a plea deal, one of the questions that the person has who's go- being asked to plead guilty to a lesser included, uh, like he is, uh, is, okay, if I do this, are we done? And it kind of astonishes me that they ended up in front of the judge without that question firmly answered between the parties. And uh, apparently Mr. Biden's uh, attorneys thought it was firmly answered, but it's not so clear now. So uh, there could be some more negotiations. I don't think he's going to get a better deal than he was offered uh, thus far. Uh, I think the chance that this is going to be worse for him is much greater than the chance that it will be better for him. Uh, on the other hand, the the sort of um, way out in left field stuff that Grassley and others have sent memos in and released uh, documents about, I don't think a lot of that is true at all. So uh, I don't think it's going to be, you know, I don't know enough about the guy's personal life to say what felonies he may have committed as a private citizen, but I don't think there's going to be this worldwide uh, conspiracy that Hunter Biden was controlling Ukraine. I, I just don't. I don't think so. Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, going back to uh, Mike Carl's point that the horrible decision made by the judge, I think it's just the opposite. I thought the judge made a very courageous and a very correct decision. This was a lousy plea agreement for what it did. It gave uh, uh, Biden, uh, Hunter Biden all sorts of protection from future charges. And uh, There's an investigation going on. Uh, and uh, the plea agreement said, regardless of what comes out in these future plea agreements, we're not going to charge anything different. The judge realized that. And the judge asked questions. And as Larry pointed out, there were two different points of view. Uh, the Hunter Biden camp said, yeah, that gives us full protection. The uh, prosecuting officer said, no, it does not. So I think the judge did the right thing, but I also think that the loser of this is going to be Hunter Biden because I think that provision for future charges, future prosecution, is going to not be included in the plea agreement. Well, correct the record. I did not say the judge was wrong. I, I, I misunderstood you. I thought I thought I, I, I said I thought Hunter really benefited in the sense that that he won't be seen as pulling a dirty deal that got by the judge there you go uh joe i believe you and the judge share an alma mater if uh, my research is correct uh that's correct and and and, uh a wise judge uh she is Uh, i i think that uh bill's correct whenever a criminal defendant has worked out a plea and that that is reduced to writing and all that's needed is to go before a judge and get the judge's seal of approval. That criminal defendant has every intent on walking into that courtroom and accepting that seal of approval and moving on with his life. The judge denied Hunter Biden that opportunity. Not a good day for Hunter Biden because now that that plea could be completely reworked, thrown in the trash can, or amended in any number of ways. The, the, the door is wide open on this again. And again, that is not good for a criminal defendant. So not a good day for Hunter. And and I got a theory as to why these attorneys appeared to be unprepared to answer the judge's questions about the effect of this plea. They know, both the government and Hunter Biden's attorneys know, that this is highly scrutinized by the media and by uh, by legal experts and I've, I'm, I would bet you anything that these attorneys were afraid to create any kind of record uh, discussing the actual terms and conditions of this plea agreement, to actually go on the record and discuss those things. And that's why I think these attorneys went in there unprepared to answer what seemed to be some somewhat basic questions from the judge. Now they've got to go back and rework it, and it'll be interesting to see what, what results from that. But I... I I would say not a good day for Hunter Biden. 
those of you drumming your fingers on the table, you might want to avoid doing that. The microphones love to pick that up there, too. Hey, uh, so uh, to, to recap and, and put this in layman's terms, right, taking as much legalese out of it, we have three attorneys in the room here. And you have two of us who think we're <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what was the reason for the plea deal to be rejected? It was am- ambiguous. Good question. No. Mike says ambiguous. Good, Joe. Uh, the, well, specifically, the question from the judge was, does this plea agreement include an agreement by the, uh, the federal government not to investigate any other potential crimes, including a FARA violation, which is a Foreign Agent Re- Registration Act violation. The argument being made that Biden was really representing foreign interests in this country and was compensated for it. Uh, that is not a part of the plea agreement. But the judge asked, does this agreement encompass even those kinds of charges? The federal government said no and actually responded saying that there is an investigation still ongoing. Biden's attorneys jumped up and said, wait a minute. We thought it did include that, and that's when things broke down. Including the Biden attorney by going through the act of tearing, <laughs> uh, tearing the plea agreement into pieces, which was theory, uh, uh, theater that has no place in the courtroom. And, and I think that's probably where Hunter Biden um, got his advantage from this not accepting the plea deal. If, if the plea deal didn't include... Um, the the absence of further prosecution then the judge saying no we're not going to accept this plea deal i think that benefited him now now his team has the opportunity to go back and 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 create a different plea deal that does include that that he can't be prosecuted further if he had accepted this and there were still ongoing investigations in other areas he could have been back on trial again for other things. So I think this this probably benefited him by them not accepting it. Mike, can you imagine anything possible that the prosecutor will accept a revised plea agreement that would give him immunity from future charges? Um, yeah, maybe some jail time. Well, no, no, that yeah, maybe. So. But my point is uh, uh, Hunter Biden had a, I think, a sweetheart deal. And the fact that it was rejected, he's not going to get the same sweetheart deal in the future. He, well, so he's not a, going to benefit. It was a sweetheart deal that did not avoid further prosecution down the line. It, his lawyers thought so. Well, but right, but the prosecutor said no. So and, and the idea that that issue did not come up until they were in front right. of the judge. Yeah. There's something missing from this story. Exactly. Uh, we there's something we don't know from and, this and story. Lies where wouldn't. I think he benefits that now they can come up with it might not be as good a plea deal, but it's a better plea deal in the fact that there's no further prosecution down the line. There's got to be two two people to dance together. I, I mean, and I, I don't think the pro, uh, prosecutor will dance to that team. So, so you think this goes to trial? That doesn't uh, no. benefit him, I don't think. Well, I think the uh, it, this this issue has to be addressed. If they can address it, I don't think they will. So I suspect it will go to trial. Deal, deals like this are made in the magistrate court of Berkeley and Morgan County and Jefferson County every single day. And it's always understood that the past is the past. You're pleading to this, and it takes care of these other charges. Nobody in their right mind would plead guilty to this and get nothing in exchange. It's not a plea agreement in that case. It's just, okay, I'm guilty. <laughs> now go ahead and keep investigating me and bring some other charges against me, and we'll see what I do then. Uh, you, it, that's just not how it ever works. And so this is there's some part of this story that we are not being told um, that's very strange. I, I, you know, you could have somebody who's involved, let's say, in a terrible car accident, and they're charged with DUI and they're charged with reckless driving, and they're charged with a bunch of other things. Their lawyer works with the prosecutor. They pick one, a serious one or a not-so-serious one, depending on the strength of their evidence. They make a deal, and they say, okay, arising out of this incident, you're going to plead guilty to reckless driving, and we're going to drop the DUI and the, and the other stuff. And that's your deal. Now, um, it's a little different for Hunter Biden because they're saying there's a whole bunch of incidents that unrelated to this one 
and you're going to plead guilty to it. But it's the same sort of thing, and there's not much incentive for somebody to plead knowing there's more charges coming down the line. Well, um, if his dad told him he'd pardon him, no matter what happens. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's the funny thing about this. If his name was Trump, he would have been pardoned if his dad was a president. We wouldn't be talking about it. Oh, yeah, that's no, no doubt. Uh, yeah. Trump's more corrupt than Biden. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I'm Good glad you guys we agree on something there finally. Don't. I'll say they're, they're both <laughs> equally corrupt. Hey, uh, we, we take our break here and come back with uh, Larry Schultz on the clock. And a segment brought to you in part by CMA Honda of uh, Winchester. More to come. The Honda HRV, CRV, Pilot, Passport, and Ridgeline. They all have one thing in common. They never back off from a challenge. Available with all wheel drive, the Honda SUV lineup has the performance you can count on and the capability to amaze. It's no wonder Kelly Blue Book's KBB.com named Honda the 2022 best value brand. CMA's Honda of Winchester, 3985 Valley Pike. CMA, moving lives forward. Based on 2022 brand image awards from Kelly Blue Book, visit KBB.com for more information. The Palace Lounge in Martinsburg is the place to be. Join us every night to relax and enjoy football or basketball games featuring either the Martinsburg Bulldogs, Shepherd University Rams, or West Virginia Mountaineers. We will have steak night every Wednesday, trip nights every Thursday, and now taco and margarita nights every Tuesday. You can find us on Facebook or call 304-267-7520. The Palace Lounge is located at 1350 Edwin Miller Boulevard in Martinsburg. Join us at the Berkeley County Youth Fair for eight action-packed days of fun for the whole family, August 5th through August 12th, featuring all your favorite live events, truck and tractor pulls, bull riding and rodeo, motocross freestyle, UTV side-by-side -side flat drags, dirt flat drags, demolition derby and figure eight, and the carnival every night of the fair. We can't wait to see you at the Berkeley County Youth Fairgrounds, 2419 Golf Course Road in Martinsburg. Follow us on Facebook or download the new BCYF app for the daily schedule of events. When you are looking for the perfect gift, look no further than L.A. Roberts Jewelers at 146 North Queen Street in downtown Martinsburg. Choose from a huge selection of unique items from the finest diamonds that make your eyes sparkle to exquisite timepieces, figurines, and collectibles. Buying from L.A. Roberts Jewelers means that you've made the decision to do business with people who've excelled in the industry for more than 100 years. They'll be here tomorrow when you need them, and if you need your jewelry or your watch repaired, they'll do that too. L.A. Roberts in downtown Martinsburg. Old world jewelers for a new age. Mayhem is everywhere. I'm your new bangs, and you can't stop staring at me. That's it. Just tilt the rear view mirror over here. And while you're checking me out more times in a library book, your car is wandering into that lane over there. More bangs? <laughs> Neat. And if you've got cut rate insurance, you could be paying for this yourself. So get Allstate. Call Martinsburg Allstate agent Gary Kelly today at 304-263-4596. Now's the time to talk with John's Pool Supplies about opening your pool. Or maybe it's time for a new above-ground or in-ground pool. John's Pool Supplies, 237 Eagle School Road, has over 30 years of experience and a large selection of products, services, and supplies for your pool or hot tub. From custom liner installation and pool inspection to free water testing, call John's Pool Supplies at 304-267-2000. JohnsPoolSupplies.com. This date, 1915, the birthday of Polka Master Frankie Yankovic. No relation to Weird Al, by the way. <laughs> Joe, as a southwestern Pennsylvanian, I thought you might appreciate a little beer barrel polka uh, bumper music. Rob, that takes me back to the days of youth when we'd attend those weddings and, and there would be a polka band. and uh, Just wonderful. Here's a true test, Joe. Where were those weddings held? What, what kind of a building? Uh, Sons of Italy. Sons of Italy or the local fire hall. That's where you held the weddings yeah. back then, right? Hey, yeah. we move uh, on to absolutely. issue number three, and uh, on the clock is Larry Schultz. Yeah, does the addition of Carlos de Oliveria as a um, third defendant in a Mar-a-Lago case in a superseding indictment that came down yesterday make it uh, more or less likely that Waltine Nada will flip on Trump or that uh, Carlos will flip on Trump? 
uh, are one of these guys now set up to flip on Donald Trump regarding specifically uh, his uh, suggestion that they've got from Mr. Oliveria's phone uh, that the boss the boss suggested that we erase the tapes uh, that we delete the server I, I thought that particular one was uh, going to be greeted with a laugh by Hillary Clinton uh, but <laughs> but they have security tapes that show nada and and they were they were uh, asked apparently by Trump to delete that footage uh, and they didn't do it and so now now there's a real a real problem and it's it's getting sort of Nixonian uh, when you start erasing stuff you know they didn't have to use their didn't have to use the secretary with her foot or bleaching like she it. was sliding into third base yeah um, so, so, so my question, question is, is uh, are one of these guys more likely to flip now all right, so the money line had Larry's issue not being about Trump at minus one thousand to one. So <laughs> you had to bet a thousand dollars to win a dollar in order for that to pay off. And uh, it's never going away. I think everybody won, by the way. Everybody put in their thousand dollars. Donald Trump could make it go away, but he's not interested. So everybody won their dollar. Everybody won their dollar. You had to put up a thousand to get your dollar back. <laughs> and, and Hornby is very wealthy this morning because of it. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Ferretti, we begin with you. Yeah, uh, well, it, you know, the lesson from Watergate that Larry referred to is that it's never the crime, it's the cover-up. And for those Trump supporters who continue to this day to maintain that Trump had every right to those documents as an ex-president under the Presidential Records Act and all that, why is he doing all this to destroy evidence? Uh, you know, if you thought the obstruction charge was strong, because there was evidence of these documents being moved around, these boxes being hidden in different places at Mar-a-Lago, right after the feds issued the subpoena, that obstruction charge just got stronger because not only were boxes being moved, but Trump was ordering his minions to destroy any video evidence of the actual moving of the boxes. So this is obstruction layered over obstruction. And it's going to get him in major trouble. To Larry's point, when you have these minions being charged with federal crimes themselves, the chances of one of them buckling and wanting to turn state's evidence just goes up. And it would not surprise me if Mr. Nada or de Oliveira would turn state's evidence. But they, lo and behold, they have an individual number four also identified in these new charges who apparently is already talking to the feds because that's where a lot of this information is coming from. So they may not need those two gentlemen to turn. Uh, but the upshot of all this is the charges against our ex-president have just gotten infinitely uh, stronger and the feds are sitting in the catbird seat on this case. Well, let's go to Mike Carl. Well, I, I, I agree that, you know, you, you increase charges against related or involved people, and you're, you increase the chance of a, you know, a plea deal that, that really burns the, the, the key defendant, the president. But I, I think it also, part of this case is to show real you know, wrongdoing in in a in a substantive way. You know that 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 was going to. You know that Trump was acting to benefit himself or to hide his his own you know wrongdoing, not just the process itself. You know the handling of documents and that type of thing. It sounds kind of bureaucratic, but if you really want the the public to be fired up about the prosecution, you need to show some real real evil and self-serving and and this this could be a step in that direction billy yeah i think there's even more of a reason for the ex-president to slow walk this whole process uh what we've been told now this was a pretty big nail to be nailing in the coffin uh 
And so it's uh, it appears to be, again, what we've been hearing and been alleged, that the case against President Trump is pretty tight. Uh, and if someone, if one of these individuals flips, it's going to be even more so. But uh, so we're, we're also being told that uh, President Trump has been advised the best way out of this is to be elected before an indictment actually before each uh, uh, decisions actually handed down. So I think that's why we're going to be seeing slow walk. I think going slow walk. He's going to use the New York case as to his advantage. As long as New York's going on, they cannot start the other three. Therefore, the longer they can hold off these other three, the more substantive cases, the better better chance he has of having election happen before. Uh, he's actually prosecuted or uh, deemed guilty. Mr. Height. So, Joe, you mentioned that, you know, you mentioned how the FBI goes in and goes through all this. I, I, I look at both of these, the Trump scenario, and I look at the Biden scenario with documents. Do the, you, you mentioned, do presidents have the right to have these documents? Yes, when they first leave the White House, they, they have the right to have these documents, and then they're supposed to negotiate with the archives to, to turn over those documents. And, and you look at the documents, you know, and you have the Biden administration who's under investigation for, for documents as well. I look at, I just want both sides to be treated equally. FBI goes into Mar-a-Lago, guns blazing, you know, takes stuff by force, and then the FBI goes into the Biden household quietly and removes documents or to the Penn Biden Center in his office and removes documents. I just see a difference in how things are handled there. You ask, Larry, your question is, will, will one of them flip? I guess that depends on how much Trump's paying them, you know, you know, to, to be quiet. And I look at both of these administrations as one being criminally stupid in the Trump administration and how he's handled things, and one being just criminally corrupt in the Biden administration. Both of them are criminal, and I think there should be charges in both instances. So is somebody going to flip on him? Don't know. One of the things that's troubling about that is when Mike Pence and Joe Biden where when it came out that they had documents, they turned them over. They didn't say, okay, here they all are, and then hold back three quarters of them and force a subpoena. Then, as we're now finding out, try to obstruct that subpoena. They didn't do all that stuff. So these cases are not in any way the same. Yeah, they, you know, you're supposed to give the documents back, but there was nobody asking Joe Biden for the documents who didn't get them right away. Trump, it was months and months, and they finally issued a subpoena after he told them he'd given them everything because they knew he was lying. That is completely different. The, the real question is, if there is a felony conviction of Donald Trump for one of these charges or one of the January 6th things, and he loses his right to vote, that will be the first time ever that a candidate for president couldn't vote for himself. And isn't that troubling? Don't people find that like a real problem? That if he doesn't himself have the right to vote, that that people who've been committed felonies but done their time and 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 that that they sometimes get their voting rights back, he's not even at the level of a person like that. He hasn't done his time. Can he can actually continue? Will that be the final thing that hurts him in the Republican primaries? I know that's kind of a different question. But holy cow. I think it depends on a lot of this is perception. And and I think for many people, there is a perception that Donald Trump is not being fairly treated. A lot of these charges are not fair. Now, I'm not saying one way or the other. I, I just said he's criminally stupid. OK, and how he's handled a lot of this. But a lot of people perceive that he has been gone after since the day he walked down the elevator that somebody has been trying to prosecute him for something for his entire political career and they and they're tired of it they're tired of what they perceive perceive as an injustice so if he's convicted and loses his right to vote it's not going to change their mind they think he was wrongly accused all along to begin with um, I, it just interests me to see if that could be the thing that breaks the 
that breaks the, the chain for him uh, and allows a Pence or a DeSantis or Chris Christie or somebody to finally start gaining on him in the polls. Circle um, back to you for a second here, Joe Ferretti. Yeah, I, I, Larry, I, to answer your question, I, I don't think so. I, I think uh, if I could be so bold as to try to get into the Republican mindset here, I, I don't think they care much about voting for Donald Trump, the individual, with, with, with all his flaws. I think they vote for something he represents to them. Uh, he's not status quo. He's a stick in the eye to the, our, our opponents on the Democratic side. Uh, that's what he represents to a lot of people. I mean, he campaigns on this very issue. He's not campaigning to solve societal problems. He's campaigning as, in his words, I'm your retribution. You know, I'm the guy who's going to bother the other side the worst, who's going to send them into a frenzy, who's going to reinstitute Trump derangement syndrome. Yeah, that's me. I'm that guy. And I think a lot of people are going to vote for him simply for that, not for what he's done or failed to do criminally, civilly or anything else. I think it's just what he represents. And, and that's where they are. Larry, final thought goes back to you. Um, I, I just believe that. And of course, we've kind of I've kind of moved this issue around a little bit. I do believe that somebody is talking on the Trump side. Or, as Joe points out, we wouldn't have a superseding indictment. If they knew this before, they would have put it up before. And I think that the, the, the angle is getting narrower and narrower. The corner is coming closer, where you're in a spot and you can't go left and you can't go right and you can't go straight ahead. So you're kind of trapped. And I think that day is coming closer. I do, unlike Joe and, and some of the others, hold out the hope that there's a good percentage of the members of the law and order Republican Party who will say, no, conviction of a felony means it's over for me. I cannot vote for a guy who can't even vote for himself. I don't know. Thank you, Larry. With the conclusion of Larry's subject, uh, audience members, please uh, see the nice lady to your left in the visor for your one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> On your way out the door. Mr. Carl with issue number five. Sticking to the same general subject. Uh, Which one of your eight subjects are you sticking to? Well, <laughs> this is the one about Biden corruption. Oh, of course. Okay. Um, would, 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 would uh, Joe Biden take a publicly administered lie detector test asking him whether he had a, a knowledge of any knowledge of Hunter's international business affairs prior to the 2020 election well, let's change that to would which we don't know because only joe biden could ever answer that to should which is more conjecture and opinion which we well based on what i'm believing is the truth the answer is no <laughs> he should not because then then he would be exposed as is lying well let's let's take out the legal aspect of it and take it from the moral aspect of well, it, that, public well if, that if, if, if he had that kind of nerve you know uh so are you disagreeing with your own premise is that what we're doing here <laughs> you put forth a subject and I, 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 no, I, I i i think biden is corrupt i don't think he's real smart but i think he's smart enough not to put himself in the in the position of exposing the lie he told when he said he had no he, he never discussed his son's business affairs with his son prior to the 2020 election. All that right. was an absolute lie, and it was published thousands of times in national media that he said it. Let's, let's uh, talk in general about Mr. Carl's topic there, uh, Mike Kite. We can't have a one-word answer <laughs> on should or would he take a lie detector test. That's obviously something that uh, none I'm of us can answer. I'm going to say... What the hell does it matter? He can't remember what he had for breakfast, so what's a lie detector test going to tell you? He might pass it more easily if he can't remember. That That's my point. He doesn't remember whether he helped his son or not. He he can't remember whether or not he, he would pardon him. The man, the man is not fit to be president. He can't remember anything. So I, I don't think a lie detector would test would tell you anything of whether or not he he has done something. He hasn't done something. You know, I stand by. He doesn't know what he had for dinner last night. All right, Joe. Let's go to you on the phone. 
Well, if precedent means anything in terms of the investigation of a president, uh, let's recall that uh, President Trump and and, uh, a lot of his cabinet and and supporters and, and people involved in his campaign refused and gave a stiff arm to Congress, refused to respond to subpoenas to come testify about uh, alleged Russian interference in his uh, election, and uh, of course the the uh, effort to extort the Ukrainian president in return for dirt on Biden. Nobody from that administration, including the president, came forward to offer any testimony in that regard. So if the precedent means anything, yeah, no, Biden's not going to come forward and, and offer any information himself, nor should he if any lawyer is advising him, which I'm sure they are. Uh, now, that being said, uh, I, I'm becoming a little troubled by what we're hearing regarding uh, Hunter Biden and Burisma and, and to what extent uh, our current president had any knowledge or any information or uh, any involvement in uh, things that Hunter Biden was setting himself up for in terms of compensation, earned or unearned. And I'm, I'm developing a wait-and-see attitude in that regard. I want to see more evidence linking the president directly to that. Right now, we've got a lot of innuendo and uh, whistleblowers that we don't even know the identity of yet. So <laughs> I think a lot remains to be learned in that regard. But I'm keeping an open mind about that. Larry? Um, I guess what troubles me the most uh, is no way Joe Biden – if I were advising him, would take a lie detector test ahead of Donald Trump. Okay, in other words, <laughs> How about if we're going to make this the issue, <laughs> so at the same time, if we're going to make this the issue, <laughs> then there's a guy who's way ahead, and he needs to get up there first. There's not going to be any lie detector tests. Um, I don't think George Washington would have taken a lie detector test about some of the stuff that happened in his presidency or Abe Lincoln. Uh, you know, that's that's not how we find out the truth. The fact is the way we find out the truth is by doing investigations and developing evidence, not saying the 2020 election was ripped off and then losing 65 lawsuits, but <laughs> showing that it was lo- that it was ripped off and they never could show a thing and they got dismissed right you know they never called a jury in uh every judge from every corner of the country that looked at him said no there's nothing here you don't you're making this up and just lately we have rudy giuliani admitting that he falsely accused those two election workers in georgia the mother and daughter and i think rudy's probably headed for a a kind of an E. Jean Carroll situation himself in terms of defamation. So I, I don't think, I mean, it's an interesting idea. I don't think any U.S. president would take a lie detector test ever. Um, and so you, and you know, you might get asked a question that it would be a crime to tell the truth to. Um, Donald Trump certainly knows about those things from Bedminster, where he was talking with people about, uh, General Milley wanting a war with Iraq when he didn't, and I've got the documents right here. I, I don't think we're going to get past this uh, situation with Donald Trump by saying Biden's just as bad. And that sounds like a lot of what we're hearing. Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, if you have your mind made up that a President Biden is corrupt, is incapable of holding the job, Nothing's going to change your mind. You're fixed into that. Uh, so a, um, a a lie detector uh, test, if he came through with flying colors, the argument will, would be that this is a technology that is prone to, to error. Uh, there needs to be, we need to get past the flamethrowers. Uh, if there is credible evidence, we need to have that presented. And we need to respond to credible evidence. And there may be credible evidence that we're not exposed to. I don't know. Uh, I have not seen evidence of it at all. I've seen a lot of accusations, but they're all from what I will characterize as flamethrowers uh, uh, on on the 
the House side and and very loyal supporters of uh, Donald Trump. But let let's get to the point that evidence will drive us to if there is a problem or not, and not just emotional rhetoric. Comes back to you, Mike Carl. Well, uh, I I appreciate the comments and and but but I, I really appreciate Larry bringing up the stolen election argument because. When the evidence does uh, come, and I, I mean, I've seen enough of it to convince me, but, you know, to uh, even convince Bill, <laughs> when that when there's that much evidence that, that they suppressed this information uh, about Bi- President Biden's involvement with his son's business, uh, then the suppression of that on the eve of the election by the uh, investigators and officials involved in, in the investigation and who who blocked the report of the laptop and everything on it that proved Biden's involvement with his son, uh, they will be the ones who stole the election. Should there be criminal charges against those people, yes or no? Absolutely. Absolutely. You mean the Trump? You mean Mike? You mean the Trump administration who was in? No, 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 no. Don't, don't, I don't care. I don't care who appointed them or under what administration it was. If 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 the uh, officials who who you know, created the oh it's Russian disinformation and all that to stop and block the re, re, the disclosure of the laptop information, uh, they were the ones on, who stole the election. <laughs> 